hello everyone good afternoon uh, i'm abraham abhishek from the water channel and uh, from meta meta welcome to the webinar this is uh, part of a series of webinars co-organized by iit delft in collaboration with the water channel one of the objectives of uh, these webinars is to connect uh, staff and the alumni of iht located in different parts of the world but in keeping with the commitment of iht and of the water channel to open knowledge uh, regarding water management and to uh, sharing learning resources that we have at our disposal uh, we keep these webinars open to all to whoever is interested in joining so we are uh, very happy to see some known familiar names but also very happy to see a number of people from outside of the fellowship of iht uh, i would at this point like to acknowledge maria laura sorrentino from iht who is co-hosting the webinar she is in the room you can see her name uh, under the host uh, bar. Uh, she is the reason these webinars are happening, the reason we are able to bring you these uh, uh, webinars from IIT every few weeks. So thanks a lot, Maria. Uh, we are delighted to have here with us the speaker for the day, uh, Benson uh, Mutuma Karimba. Uh, uh, Benson is a graduate of IIT, completed his master's in land and water development for food security. And uh, he did that with some distinction. He won the WSE Thesis Award, which is an uh, award constituted by uh, Mr. Walter Bowden. So we have the pleasure of having with us here in this room, right here, right now. Uh, he is himself a, a former student of IHE. Uh, this award, the uh, WSE Thesis Award, is given to the best thesis from um, uh, from among the master's students in a given year. And Benson got it for his dissertation, which had the uh, Actually, exactly the same title as uh, the webinar today. He is essentially presenting uh, uh, the work that he did for his uh, thesis. And the topic is dynamics of private smallholder irrigation using sand river aquifers in semi-arid lands. I have not the opportunity to, I have not had the opportunity to study Benson's work in great detail, but I did have the opportunity to briefly speak to him about it last week. And I'm very curious. I'm really looking forward to his present to his, uh, to his presentation today for uh, two specific reasons. One is that um, from what I understood, this is a kind of irrigation development that has gone on uh, without much government support, without too much support from NGOs. This is really a phenomenon that has taken shape on the back of a small farmers' own initiative. So a good understanding of this will have uh, several, uh, uh, several learnings, several lessons for all of us uh, involved in water education and research and practice, especially uh, those of us doing these things in the specific field of irrigation development. The second reason why I'm looking forward to the presentation today is that um, these farmers who are developing groundwater sources for irrigation on their own are doing so in semi-arid areas and uh, these are part of the uh, these are parts of the world uh, that are at the front line of water scarcity induced by you know climate change so i'm sure it will be quite inspiring and quite instructional to learn about uh, the story of these farmers from kenya so without further ado i would like to hand things over to benson now he would seems to have dropped out. I'm pretty sure he'll be with us again in just a few seconds. Benson, I think you can hear me. Could you please uh, try and activate your camera? Yes. Uh, before actually handing things over to Benson, I would like to encourage you to please keep this webinar very interactive. If you have questions and comments, uh, please put them in the chat box here that you uh, have already uh, uh, found, many of you here. Um, and we will discuss each one of them in the Q&A session uh, just after the presentation. With that, I would like to ask Benson to please jump in and take it away. Benson. Hello. hope you can hear me. Thank you very much, Abraham, for the introduction. And uh, it's a pleasure uh, being here today and uh, having the opportunity to present the work that I did for my research here in Kenya. Um, so that we can be able to share the knowledge and uh, learn from it and hopefully also get to hear um, also uh, your experiences on the same. So um, my name is Benson Mutuma and I'll be presenting uh, this webinar on the dynamics of private smallholder irrigation using uh, sand river aquifers in semi-arid land. 
Um, this uh, research was done in Kenya in a place called Kadiado, which is in the south of Kenya. And um, I'll be talking about it uh, a bit later on the study area and on the, what, what I was able to see and what I was able to, to find out from the area regarding the smallholder farmers there. Um, I'll start with a, with a brief uh, introduction or background of the importance of uh, agriculture in sub-Saharan sub Africa. And um, in, here in the region, uh, agriculture contributes to about 30% of the GDP in various countries uh, in the region, and it employs about 67% of uh, the population, of which majority live in the rural areas and depend on uh, agriculture for their livelihoods. However, um, when you look at irrigation development, it's Uh, hello, everyone. Sorry, I think. Uh, uh, sorry about that. Benson has just dropped out. Uh, and yeah, he's right back with us. Sorry about that. I hope you can hear me. I was saying that um, about only six percent of the irrigation, uh, or only six, only six percent of the cultivated area is under irrigation in sub-Saharan Africa. So we're still very behind in terms of irrigation development. However, uh, recent research has shown that uh, smallholder farmers, mostly in the region, are developing irrigation using private capital with very little government support or external support from donors or uh, other external agencies. And this is mainly driven by um, the availability of water. Uh, smallholder farmers are very keen to follow places or to go to places where um, co conditions are conducive for, for irrigation development. These are places where the water is, uh, water is accessible. Uh, this is made possible also using uh, low-cost technology uh, that they're able to afford. And uh, we can see this uh, in semi-arid areas where um, research has also shown that uh, sand rivers, which are very common in many semi-arid areas in the region, can actually store water under the uh, under the sand layers, which are characteristic of, of these rivers, these seasonal rivers. And these are coming to be known as alluvial aquifers, and they offer opportunity for irrigation development in many of these semi-arid areas, which previously there was no farming which was taking place. Um, but much of these private smallholder irrigation remains invisible in a way because it is largely informal. Uh, most of the agreements and most of the working systems among these farmers are very informal. And therefore, you do not see much of these, uh, this kind of irrigation development in literature or in any development agenda or policies. And therefore, there is very little understanding on the, of the risks and uh, the challenges that the farmers face and how they are able to cope with these, uh, with these challenges. There are also concerns about the sustainability of the use of natural resources such as land and water uh, because of this unprecedented or very rapid increase in uh, smallholder irrigation in areas which is and which is not uh, is not is, it's unchecked. There, is, there are no rules or regulations many uh, which which govern how this development is taking place. So there are concerns that maybe in future the, the there could be overuse of resources or. The, 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 this kind of resources will not be sustainable uh, looking at the future expansion needs or the needs of, of water with other, other users. And looking at our study area, um, it is in Kajiado County. The, this, this river is called the Olkeriai River. It, it's one of the major seasonal rivers in this area. And Kajiado is basically a county which is on the border between Kenya and Tanzania. And um, it is a semi-arid area which is dominated mainly by rangelands. The, ma the majority of people living there are the Maasai's who traditionally are livestock keepers. So it is not a place where farming is very common. Uh, much of the land is very semi-arid and they receive very low rainfall, so there is very little farming. And this river uh, is in central Kajiado. The Olkere River is in central Kajiado, and it is a major sand river in the in the in the area. And it has been used for many years by the local communities um, for domestic for provision of domestic uh, water for using domestic purposes, and also for watering their livestock. But over the last decade or so, uh, this 
these alluvial aquifers which are found under the under the sand layers in the river have been found to have the potential to even support irrigation development and this has led to a cropping up of irrigation expansion near a strip of land uh, near the near the river banks because that's where uh, farmers are able to access water easily and they can use uh, portable pumps to pump water from uh, shallow wells or scoop holes from the river and they're able to irrigate the lands which are just adjacent to the river and as you can see on the uh, in this map here the green dots represents the where the farm plots are or the farm plots which were visited they are only concentrated on this narrow strip uh, along the river and therefore the, the research question Sorry, again, I think something is up with uh, Benson's connection. He should be with us shortly as he was a few, uh, a few minutes ago. Thank you. Uh, Benson, your microphone, we can't quite hear you. In this research, oh, can you hear me right now? Yeah. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry for that. Um, I'm, I'm using a LAN connection and maybe it has a little problem, but I'll try and sort it out. The research questions were first to find out the, what are the characteristics of the farming systems along the Olkiriai River, being that this is, a, this is an area which has developed irrigation, where irrigation has developed uh, over the last few years. So it is a, a place where farming systems are not uh, they, are, they are kind of changing, they are very dynamic and first of all we wanted to, I wanted to characterize and see the characteristics of the farming systems along the river. Secondly was to find the main challenges and uh, facing the smallholder farmers along um, this river and how they cope with these challenges and to that led to look at now the trajectories of development of individual farmers because these farmers are different uh, in terms of their capacity to farm and in terms of their resources too. So to look at how different farmers' uh, development trajectories are affected by the challenges and the risks that they face and how they are able to cope with them. Um, the methodology of the research design was first of all to look at the test study where I studied Google Earth images for the area to identify the study area boundaries. And then we did a baseline survey to collect farm plot data um, using structured questionnaires. And 23 farms, uh, in the baseline survey, 214 farm plots were visited, of which 107 were interviewed, and the rest were not operational at the moment. And then 23, farmers, uh, 23 farm plots were selected for in-depth interviews using semi-structured interviews to collect in-depth data on now the challenges and the coping strategies of, of, of different farmers. And after that, uh, data analysis was uh, conducted to look at the typology of farming systems and drawing the trajectories, uh, basing, basing them on the farming histories of different farmers. Um, there were three main farming systems uh, that were in this area. That There are myriad of uh, farming systems, but three main farming systems were identified. The first one were um, the low resource individual farms. These were farms which were managed by single uh, farmers who are providing both capital and labor on the farm. I call them individual uh, farms because it was a single farmer who was uh, actually managing the farm and also providing the capital, the capital and also the labor to, to farm on the farm plot. These, these farm plots were uh, generally small because they were 0 0.7 hectares in size and um, they they were growing crops mainly for the local market and subsistence and they had very little off-farm incomes or government support or even access to credit facilities. The second farming system was also individually managed by a single farmer or um, a, a single farmer but now the difference was that these had high resource, medium to high resource farmers meaning that the farmer provided the capital to farm but the labor was employed so the farmer employed either uh, farm, farm workers on a temporary or permanent basis to work on the farm plots. These, these, these farm plots were mostly uh, the, the largest in size because they averaged around 2.4 hectares and they grew crops both for the uh, local market and also some for the export markets. 
the third farming system, which was the majority or most of the farming system, most of the farms who are using this farming system was a partnership farming system, which brought together um, a group of farmers, either two or three farmers, who partnered with uh, a capital provider. Locally, these capital providers were known as Tajiris. Uh, a Tajiri is a Swahili name for a rich person. So in this context, the Tajiri uh, was used to to describe the person who provided capital to farm, or he provided all the money required to buy the inputs and uh, and and uh, support the farming venture, while the group of farmers uh, provided the labor. So it was it was a partnership between a Tajiri on one side and a group of farmers on the other side. And the the good thing with this farming system is that at the end of the season, when when they when they harvested the crop and they sold the crop, these um, the, the Tajiri would recoup the, the 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 capital that he or she had invested, and then the profit that was left there was split on a 50-50 basis between the farmers and 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 the Tajiri, meaning that it was more or less um, kind of a business partnership where the farmers and the Tajiri had equal shares in the farming venture, and it was the the most common type because out of uh, 107 uh, plots that were interviewed, uh, 80 of them or 75, about 75% were using uh, this partnership system, whereas the remaining 25% was split between the two types of individual farming systems. Um, this is a the grammatic representation of how this farming system worked. Uh, looking at system one, which is the low resource uh, farming system, we, we see that um, they the farmer provides the labor and also the capital, uh, and the the farm uh, the, the produce is sold to the local market. There are a few of them who are selling the produce to the city markets, and all city markets uh, were accessed through brokers. Anyone who had to to sell uh, produce to the city market had to go through the brokers, and the second farming system um, also the second farming system country. Uh, comprised of uh, the owner who employed labor, and this employed labor was, was used on the farm plots, and they supplied also to the local markets and also to the city markets through the brokers, and also the third farming system, which had the Tajiri, and one Tajiri could manage one farm plot or even two farm plots, uh, depending on, on the, the amount of capital that they had. Um, so what are the what were the challenges and and the risks that these farmers faced? The first main challenge was uh, crops, uh, the pests and diseases which which uh, were facing the the farmers. This this was a new area where farming was not being done before, and the intro, the introduction of mainly uh, tomato. The two main crops which were being grown were tomatoes and watermelons. Um, they were prone to crops, uh, pests and diseases, and this had the effect of increasing farming costs because um, with these pests and diseases had to be controlled using uh, agrochemicals, and because um, of, of the, the because of these now the, the there was an increase in the in the farming cost. The second challenge was the exploitation by, of the farmers by the brokers. As I said before, any farmer who wanted to sell to the city market had to go through uh, a system of brokers who were in the area and. No buyer could come to the area to buy any farm produce without going through the broker. So the brokers were kind of the middle person between the buyers in the city and the and the and the farmers at the farm level. And these, at times, these brokers exploited the farmers because the farmers had very little knowledge on 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 the market prices. So they pushed down the market prices so that they could buy at very low prices from the from the farmers. There was also a very lack of uh, a very high lack of support networks, especially for the low resource farmers. Low resource farmers, um, the ones with the very little resources, had very little access to credit, and also they had very little off-farm incomes, um, and this severe, severely affected the um, the ability to to develop irrigation. Because in case of any external shock, let's say um, th th their crops were infested by a crop, some pests or diseases, or there was a flooding incident. Without any credit facility, all their capital would be lost. But um, on the other two types, the high resource farmers and the Tajiri systems, who mainly relied on on the Tajiri to bring in the the 
the income, they were a bit cushioned from these uh, farming, uh, farming uh, risks and challenges. There was also a lot of disputes among the farming stakeholders. This was mainly observed in um, the third system of uh, the third system of, of irrigation, which was a partnership system between Tajiris and, and farmers. These systems were mainly on an uh, informal basis, and through through the season there could be uh, very many disagreements or disputes, uh, which were brought about firstly by the, if any of the Tajir was unreliable, if a Tajir was not able to bring all the farming uh, the farming inputs required in time, uh, the farmers usually abandoned the farm and went to seek Tajiris with uh, better resources. There was also uh, a bit of dishonesty because, uh, as I said, uh, the Tajir, when they sold the products or then when they sold the farm produce, the Tajir was first of all supposed to recoup their capital um, that they had invested in the farm. So. Some Tajiris were found to to increase uh, the cost of the input so as to be able to recoup more money than than was uh, actually there, meaning that the profit that they shared with the farmers was actually lower than than expected, and this brought a lot of disputes among them and the farmers. There was also water shortage, which was um, not a very big problem at the moment because the capacity was not yet exceeded for for farming, but um, there were incidences where farmers were complaining of water shortages, especially in um, in, in areas where there was uh, sand harvesting. There were there were areas in the in the along the river where sand harvesting was very very intense, and uh, close to these areas there were problems with water shortage. And this points to a future problem or a red flag in future because if it's not regulated, there could be there could be um, more severe water shortages in in future. Um, the coping strategies of, of these farmers, remember each farmer um, had their own coping strategy depending on the risks and challenges that they faced. And one of the coping strategies was either downgrading or upgrading uh, production capacity at critical times. As you can see in this trajectory, this is an example of one farmer who was, um, was a low resource farmer. And all through within the years, there were seasons where um, she made good profit out of out of the farming ventures and other seasons where because she did not have a lot of resources and she suffered losses in previous season she got to a point where she could not farm anymore and this down, downgrading of um, the production capacity could reach a point where a farmer would stop farming completely maybe for a season or two as they seek other means of of getting income and then after a season or two, they go back to farming. So this kind of trajectory reached a point where the farmer can stop farming and then come back later after a few years. And it was one of the strategies that they used to, to cope with, with, the, with the challenges and the risks of farming. The second strategy was the diversification of crops and incomes. This was mainly found with uh, farmers who had uh, more resources to, 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 to use in the farming system. And you find that their trajectory was mostly on an upward basis because um, they, they could they, they, they were not very much affected with, um, with with shocks even though there were seasons where they suffered losses but because they had um, a lot of other off farm incomes that they could still invest in farming you find that they diversified their crops uh, some of them got into export markets of um, french beans which, which which was a new thing most of the farmers were farming tomatoes and watermelons, which were bringing a lot of problems, especially with the pests and the diseases. But these farmers found a way of diversifying to crops and uh, going into contract farming for French beans. And you see that they continued uh, their trajectory on an, on an upward basis. And another strategy was uh, the flexibility and mobility of farmers, where you find that um, mostly in the third system of farming where you had the, the Tajiri and, and the farmers, they, these kind of arrangements were flexible enough so that because they were only seasonal based, these, these arrangements were, were not, they were, they were very informal and they were based on, they were supposed to end at the end of the season. Once the, once the farmer, once the farmer, um, they harvest the crop, they may opt to continue with the, with the arrangement, the partnership arrangement or they move on to find a better Tajiri or to find better farmers. And in this, um, for an example of this uh, farmer who had moved
from so many places changing tajiris from one area to another because of one problem or the other because um shows that they had the flexibility they are not tied down to one tajiri where they could work with them maybe for a number of years they could work uh, with them in for one season and if the the partnership had any any issues or they did not make profit with that with that tajiri they could uh, shift and go and seek a better farming uh, partnership um now this um, leads us to a short dis uh, discussion on how private smallholder irrigation is developing and from this research and from the results that uh, were able to be observed from the case study it shows that there is a great level of um, self organization among private smallholders something that is not is, is not very much documented and this has brought in new farming systems as a result of um, institutional bricolage. Bricolage is the piecing together of different working arrangements and borrowing together of, um, of working arrangements from other farming systems from, from other places. Majority of farmers who are working in this area were migrant farmers who are coming in from either other regions where they were farming before, some are even coming in from, from Tanzania, and they brought their knowledge to this area so as to to be able to form new farming system arrangements. We can see this in the example of the Tajiri system, which uh, uh, was brought together the Tajiris who are mostly uh, business, business people or uh, people who wanted to invest in farming, but they did not have the knowledge, but they formed uh, farming systems with the, with the farmers who had the knowledge on how to farm, but they did not have the resources. And this brought in the partnership system of farming. And it, uh, also uh, brought in the, the coping strategy because um, many farmers did not have access to resources or off-farm incomes, but this new kind of farming system was able to, to uh, solve that problem for them. The second thing is that um, the private smallholder farmers is not confined to any geographical location. There was a lot of flexibility and movement uh, with farmers moving from one area to another and this was mainly facilitated because of the informal agreements that were there the, uh, between the landowners and, and the Tajiris and the farmers. Um, access to land was also mainly on lease, lease basis. Um, migrant farmers were coming into the area, leasing land in the area, and um, for only short periods, maybe a year or two years, and therefore moving, in, if conditions were not very favorable, they could move into to, to other areas. And this shows that uh, really irrigation is not fixed to one area, but it can it, it is very mobile and it, it can move from one place to another in, in its development. And um, finally, is that um, there needs to be uh, some adaptive resource management plans because, um, as you can see, it is not yet a big problem in this area, but we can see future uh, conflicts in this resource because um, around around Kajiado area, Kajiado is flanked with the with the city of Nairobi and other urban growing areas, and there is there is a lot of demand not only for for food that is that is coming out of the irrigation, but also for building sand that is also harvested from the same sand river. But the, uh, the harvesting of sand also brings about challenges because it, it it may reduce the holding capacity of the water in the river, and this might uh, bring problems of water shortages and also conflict among these different um, kind of users. And therefore, really, there's need to, to look also into the sustainability of how this resource is being used. And remember that the, the resource as it is right now, it is being used without, um, without much control because the, the land rights and the water rights to abstract water from the river is being given by the landowners who, who own the land in this area. So, it is really, um, there is really need to be able to sit down with all the stakeholders and see how the resource may be, may be used uh, in future and may be used in a more uh, sustainable way. Thanks a lot, Benson. Thanks for the great presentation. We have a um, lot of questions that already is the in. End of my presentation. So let's get right to it. The first question is from Dr. Ramilis uh, Okwani, who asks, uh, what are the legal structures that affect the riverbank cultivation in consideration of the 
present legal regulations for riparian zones uh, in Kenya. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Okwani. Um, currently, um, the legal regulations is that there should be no cultivation um, near the river banks to up to um, there should be no cultivation near the river banks to a distance of uh, 30 meters from the river on both sides of the bank. Um, this is according to what is there on law and and what is there um, in in the in the in the um, in the legal frameworks, but what we see in this area is that there is very little regulation about these. Uh, like has happened before, I think Benson will be right back in just a few seconds. Uh, sorry about that. Thanks for your patience. Yes. Yes, I was uh, replying to Dr. Okwani, um, saying that what we observe in this area even though the regulation says that there should not be any cultivation um, up to uh, from 30 meters to the 30 meters from the from the river banks, there's still a lot of cultivation because this cultivation is dependent on the on the alluvial aquifers and the, these alluvial aquifers can only be accessed near the river bank. So that is um, what is conflicting in this in this scenario. Mm -hmm. Thank you. The next question is from Walter, who asks, uh, does the system benefit the Tajiris uh, more than the farmers? Can a farmer become a Tajiri herself or himself thanks to the irrigation? Has that happened? Um, thank you very much, uh, Walter. I would say the system is, is mutually beneficial as it is right now uh, because the Tajiri is, um, is, when you look on the side of the Tajiri, they it's, it's a risky investment to invest capital in, in a venture without knowing the results. Remember, the farmers are using their knowledge and they're investing their time, uh, their time and labor on the farm. The Tajiri is investing the capital, but once the, once the, the product is sold, the Tajiri is first of all supposed to recoup their capital invested. But there are instances where maybe the market price is very low or there has been a destruction of, crop, uh, of the crop because of one reason or another, maybe pests or diseases, or maybe there, is a, there are floods in the area. The Tajiri may still not be able to recoup all their capital. So in that instance, they, they may suffer a loss even without the profit. The farmers are not tied to, to, the, to, the, to the profit of the of the, in, the, they are not tied to the capital there. Even though the Tajiri suffers uh, any loss in capital, the, the season ends at that and they are not, they cannot carry that over to another season. They might opt to go to a different Tajiri and start all over again. So I would not say that it benefits the Tajiri, though they, they are the, the first ones to, to recoup their, to recoup their capital. But in terms of the profits, the profits are shared 50-50. So they are, the profits are shared 50-50 and this is where, where, it, where it matters and it means that both parties kind of benefit equally from, from what they have invested. The, the Tajiri has invested capital and gets 50% of, of the profits and the farmers have invested their time and, uh, and labor and also they get 50% of the profit. Um, there are instances where uh, a farmer can become a Tajiri, yes, that is, that is very possible. Though this this is quite um, it was quite rare in this in this area because of um, of two reasons. First is that many farmers saw the the accumulation of capital as and then investing it in farming as as a very risky option. So they still uh, insisted on being farmers themselves because they, they their knowledge was mostly on the farming. Though um, their aspiration there there are some who had aspirations to become the Tajiri. But the way the system was set up, it required a lot of um, a lot of savings and a lot of uh, a lot of accumulation of the capital that they've made all through the years. And because one season they might have profits, the other season they might have losses. It kind of diluted the their upward trajectories towards becoming Tajiri. Not unless they they, they had uh, some either off farm incomes or they invested in other other sources except except farming. 
Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, from uh, Dr. Akwani again, who I think is referring to the third farming system that you referred to in um, uh, one of your slides. Uh, and is that third arrangement a result of poverty constraints of the farmers, or is it an economic basis? Uh, is it a choice on uh, based on pure economics? Or um, it, it's actually, I would say it's actually both, because first of all, Farmers are, are constrained uh, in terms of the resources. They may they may not uh, have the capital required to go into this intensive uh, irrigation of uh, of tomatoes and, and watermelons, which requires uh, capital to have uh, to buy the pumps and to buy the irrigation pipes and to buy the fertilizers and the seeds. So many of these farmers are coming from areas where they have been farming, but they do not have uh, the resources to go into that kind of intensive farming. You can see that, especially in the first farming system, where we have farmers with very small, um, very small plots of land, and these farmers are not able to have capital to to go into the intensive farming. So they only concentrate on farming for the local for the local market and subsistence farming. And also, you can see their land sizes are very small. Um, so in that instance, when you look at it from the farmers from the farmers perspective, it is a poverty constraint. The lack of resources is not is is pushing them towards uh, looking for tajiris where they they can find someone who can support them to farm, and then them they can use their own experience and knowledge in farming. When you look at the the side of tajiris, uh, a tajiri is someone who has basically the capital and they want to invest it in 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 a in in a certain way so that it can it can have uh, some profits. And the Tajiri, you might find there are business people maybe who live in the cities. They're not necessarily people who live in this, in this area. And investment options, people can choose to invest in different ways. But from one, for, for one reason or another, the Tajiris look at farming as one of their investment options. So, but because they do not have knowledge on how to farm and they live far away and they, they cannot be able to come and manage the farm plots themselves, they decide to get into this partnership system and they trust the farmers with their capital with the hope that at the end of the season they will have a profit for it. So we say it is, it is both ways. It is also a, it's a, a poverty constraint. It is pushed by poverty constraint from the farmers. And when you look at it, at it from the Tajiris, it is, it is an economic uh, form of investment. Right. Uh, the next question is about uh, uh, system two. Uh, question from uh, from Anilik is uh, why does system two still have substantial off farm income compared to system one? She would expect it to be the other way. Right? Um, system system two has a substantial off farm incomes because majority of of these um, individual farmers are the landowners themselves. Um, many of them are local uh, Maasai people who have picked this farming experience from uh, or farming knowledge from these migrant farmers who are coming in and they have their own land, uh, big tracts of land that they also want to get into the farming, uh, into the farming uh, business. So they, and also they, they have substantial off-farm incomes because they have um, things like um, livestock, you know, I, I talked before saying that uh, the local massa is most of them are livestock keepers and they have, um, they, they keep a lot of livestock. These livestock also act as off-farm income because when they are, when through the season they can be, they can be sold and this, this uh, cash got from the off-farm income is invested into the, into the farming. However, system one is, um, is majorly small, um, small, um, small farmers or uh, I wouldn't call them small farmers. They are low-resource farmers who have not yet found, or who are um, who have not yet been able to uh, link up. Found uh, they have not been able to find uh, a tajiri to support them in their farming, and therefore the the only small resources or the only uh, money they have, they can investment invest it in their in their own um, in their own small in the in least farm plots first of all. But they are not able also to employ uh, people to work on those farms. So you find them uh, working on the farm plots themselves. So if you have one farmer who is working on on a farm plot, there is a very small uh, there is a limit up to what amount of size of the size of land they can be able to farm. 
So these these uh, system one farmers are maybe in something we may call a poverty loop. They are not able to break into the next system of farming because they are constrained first of all with the resources and the labor. They're not uh, they're not able to to break into another level of farming. And in case of any external shocks that may be they may come into their farming venture, they will go back uh, or they will lose all their resources. But when you look at system two, because they have uh, incomes or off farm incomes which they might invest in the farm, they are able to diversify and they are able to expand their their farming ventures. Okay. Uh, the next question is one that you ma you have kind of addressed in some of your later slides. It's from Ricardo, who asks, is uh, a water abstraction licensing system in place? And how is groundwater management of these aquifers, these kind of aquifers um, proposed? Uh, I, I, in, in the course of the, of the research, I was able to interview um, one respondent or one uh, respondent from the Water Management Authority that that is supposed to oversee the abstraction of water from all natural resources in the region. But there was a challenge that was raised, uh, which was uh, the, the, the licensing of uh, abstraction of water really depends on the organization at, at this lower level, like the water users, water resources users associations. But in this area, when you look at it, it is an area where most of the farmers are coming in uh, from outside. They're not local residents in this area. And therefore, um, there's really not a very well developed water users, water users resources associations. And therefore, the implementation or the licensing, the, the implementation of these licensing laws for water abstraction is very, is very poor. And this is a major challenge uh, to the to the Water Resources Authority. And um, the management of uh, the management of the groundwater aquifer, there is uh, currently there is no there is no proposal on how this groundwater is 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 is, uh, is being managed at the moment because the as i said the land the the abstraction the the water right or the rights to abstract water is given by the landowner in this area there is a local agreement that the landowner is also the owner of the of the water in the aquifer so when you find all across the river there is there are so many uh, landowners and therefore different landowners have their own different uh, rules on how the water is supposed to be abstracted so really if there is a proposal that is uh, to, if there's a proposal for the management of the groundwater, it would have to bring in all the landowners first and also the farmers. Okay, thanks a lot. The next question is from Walter, who, was asked, who would like your views on uh, if there's a possibility to set up a farmers cooperative with the advantage of having easier access to microfinance, a voice against Tajiri's uh, ability to have more leverage on the price of agricultural inputs and outputs? Um, the possibility for to set up a um, farmers cooperative is there, but um, this farmers cooperative, um, according to the study that I did, or a cooperative being set up on a top-down approach would would really not, uh, I would say, to not be successful in this area. Basically because um, this kind of farming arrangements with Tajiris is is very, um, I would say it's very, it's, it's, it's a response as, as to what the farmers need. And bringing together, um, setting up a, a cooperative would, would mean that uh, people formalizing on these agreements that are there and currently, from what was observed, is that uh, there are so many uh, a myriad of farmers who are coming from various areas, and some farmers are coming also from across the borders. Remember, these people maybe are not in this area, as you can say, legally. So they might not be uh, very open in to the idea of setting up a, a farmers cooperative. But um, on the issue of microfinance, they, there could be um, a way to, or there a proposal could could work in in terms of uh, setting setting up microfinances that could be could support the farmers not not really to to be against the tajiris because um, the tajiris offer more than offer more than than capital uh, for for farmers in terms of um, they offer some sort of soft loans or credit facilities to the farmers 
which are returned uh, without any any interest. They're just deducted out of the what the what the farmers are supposed to get. But the microfinance or these uh, formal institutions would uh, bring in um, issues of interest, and um, most of the farmers are not. Uh, most of the farmers that we talk, I talked to, they were very, uh, they are not very, um, very open to the idea of going to banks because they were saying that farming, farming is very risky, and therefore they preferred these kind of informal uh, ways of uh, of farming because um, they mitigated and against in case there were losses, they were not tied down to any, to any, to any debt on their part. Sorry. Yeah, that's understandable, I suppose. Uh, the next question is from Josefa, who asks if the safe yield of the sand aquifer is known, and how do the farmers know if there will be adequate water available um, for irrigation? Currently, there, there's, there's very little study, or the, the studies are not established, or there are studies that are uh, yet to establish the, the safe yield from the from the sand sand river aquifers, it requires extensive studies of a, a long time, and this is a remote areas which has uh, previously not not had any gauging station or any other studies done for on the aquifer. So there is there is really no safe field known uh, officially known at the moment, and um, the farmers uh, really will just know the the, the the amount of water abstracted, the amount of water that is required for irrigation, depending on the levels of of water in in either their well or their scoop holes, but they kind of um, mitigate against this if there is there are low levels of water maybe in the well. Uh, one of the ways where which they find to mitigate against this is that their water sharing arrangements. It's not uh, strict that a farmer uses their own well or their own scoop hole. If there there is a point where the water is is very low in the well, they have options to maybe go to a, to a, to the next farmer or to the next well and. Uh, come up with a sharing a water sharing arrangements and they can be able to move their pump from their own well to the other well and these uh, informal arrangements are what makes the, the irrigation thrive in the area okay. uh, thanks the next question is from Jonah who asks uh, what is the place of uh, governments, local, state or district or uh, at the national level in the allocation of resources and also in the, the overall monitoring? There, there are two levels of, of government in Kenya. The, the local government or the county government uh, and the national government. Um, the water resources on a regional basis is part of the water resources authority that is a, is a parastatal of the national government. Whereas the agricultural development and irrigation development is a, is a devolved function, which is part of the local government. That means it's part of the Kajiado County. Um, for the supporting of, of the farmers, um, the local government is supposed to initiate um, subsidies, maybe for the provision of uh, fertilizers or other farming inputs. But there has been a challenge even in the agricultural extension of uh, of Kajiado County because um, of very little resources. It has not. It's, it's a devolved function, but it has not got up and running. So, um, according to the to the interviews that I conducted, it's there is very little penetration of both levels of government into this kind of of irrigation, and that's why I said it is almost like it's invisible. It's not very very well, uh, very well known in policy and uh, development agenda. And though there is, there is um, the, the national government and, and the and the water resources authority is supposed to, at the overall monitor how water is being used in the area. The they do this in collaboration with uh, water resources users association. And uh, as I said before the informal nature and the very mobile nature uh, of this kind of irrigation makes it very hard for what are these users associations to develop because farmers are maybe in that area for a very short period of time and then they move out and go to another area. So there is still very, um, 
there's still very little penetration of both levels of government into into the resource allocation and and monitoring thank you we have in the room uh, robert vaug from practica foundation who uh, work in mozambique and zimbabwe on sand rivers and the question is if there is a uh, apart from the problem of water sh uh, shortage is uh, one of the problems also uh, lack of availability or lack of uh, knowledge regarding low cost technologies to access water between 0 to 10 meters uh, apart from uh, uh, the traditional methods like shallow um, ponds and holes i didn't find i didn't find the the problem mainly on um, the availability of of knowledge um, what, what I found is that farmers basically learn from each other and across the area, I would say 100% um, of all the farmers were either accessing water uh, using uh, shallow wells or accessing water using scoop holes. Um, the shallow wells uh, were there because um, they, they were more durable. Shallow wells, when they are dug, they can, um, they can, uh, they can stay for, for a bit, maybe three, four years. Without, without maintenance, but scoop holes, the scoop holes that are uh, being uh, dug in the riverbeds, they are very prone to flooding. They are washed away by the, by the floods. But still, um, they, are, they are preferred because they are low cost. They do not, they do not cost much to, to dig these scoop holes. And the farmers can just move from uh, one farm to another and, and dig another scoop hole and, um, and still access water from the, from the Sand River. Um, and this kind of um, this kind of, of knowledge is, is is passed on from from farmer to farmer, and and that is what they prefer prefer the most. Though um, in terms of irrigation access, uh, there was also very little uh, there was very little penetration of water saving technology like drip irrigation because most farmers uh, depended on uh, pumping water directly to to furrows or to small basins where the crop was grown. And I would attribute this to also the, the nature of the way they want to move from one season to another. If, if the farmers would invest in maybe a very permanent, a, a permanent or semi-permanent uh, irrigation system, it would be hard for them to, to, to move from one area to another. So I would say it's not really the lack of knowledge of these technologies which are there, but it is, uh, it is a, a way which allows them to, to be very mobile and to be very uh, flexible in changing uh, geographical areas and in changing from one farm to another. Yeah. Interesting. Um, the next question is from Jay Miguel, who asks if there is currently a, um, a water-related conflict between the smallholder farmers and, uh, the, uh, and the pastoralists. And do you think um, this can be a problem in the there future? Is, um, I would say the, 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 the conflict is very localized. Um, it is not something that it, it's not something that you can. Um, it's not something that uh, is very extensive because um, the only small problems is maybe uh, livestock that is grazing on uh, on 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 farmland and. But there is not really uh, that much of conflict. These small conflicts are mainly handled between the farmers and the landowners. But in future, um, as more farmers may be coming to this area, if there will not be um, a very solid or, a, or a, mani a, a solid management plan on how to manage the water resources and also the land, which brings together the pastoralists, uh, the landowners, and also the farmers, there could be a future problem in, in this. And, um, the, the notion is that the, the Sand River, um, basically it's, it's a local resource which benefits the, the, local, the, local, um, the local Maasai community. But the farmers who are mostly coming from outside, they are the, the ones who are benefiting from the, from, from the irrigation. So there is that sort of conflict that uh, the Sand River, the farming is mostly beneficial to people from outside while the, the sand harvesting and the water in the Sand River uh, is beneficial to the to the local people. So that's why I say that to avoid such future conflict, there is a, there's a need to bring together all these parties to to be able to form a, a sound uh, management plan for the for the resource. Uh, we have Dr. Okwani again, who asks, in the matter of high mobility, how is that? 
so how is high mobility affecting the land and water conservation practices given the higher interest for immediate benefits um, rather than long term sustainability this is this is actually um one of another matter of 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 sustainability because um we find that because of this mobility and farmers uh, moving from from one farm to another there are large swathes of land which are left without uh, without any any farmland remember i out of the 214 farm plots that i visited around 60% were operational at the moment that was uh, in december 2019 and 40% of of farm plots were not were not uh, were not uh, currently operational these were these farm plots which were not operational were farm plots that had been farmed maybe a year before or a season before and then left as farmers shifted to another area to look for more fertile land this is affecting um mostly the riparian vegetation because farmers want or the farmers want to move to areas which has not been farmed before because they they view those areas as, as being more fertile and when they are moving to this area they are uh, destroying the natural vegetation and the riparian vegetation near the near the river while they are leaving behind uh, other parts of land which have not have not uh, have not been planted with any trees or they are not replanting the vegetation that was there before the other um, the other concern is that uh, because of these intensive irrigation or irrigation farming practices there is a there is a very big tendency to to use a lot of chemicals agrochemicals and uh, such inputs because farmers want to get the, pro the the maximum amount of productivity from this season and this um, mostly you find it uh, though it was not part of the research but you the, the effect of this is that these these agrochemicals might wash down to the to the alluvial aquifers and pollute pollute the water which in future might also become a, a big problem so all these challenges are, are uh, they're not currently being experienced but in future they they might they might come back to 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 being a very big problems in the area uh we have more questions again from uh, robert who has a series of questions the um, first the question is how long are these in, uh, the land lease constructions are basically they are they're not tied down to any 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 time frame they are uh, they are basically they, they basically depend on the agreement between the the farmers and the land owners um there are some land owners who may want to lease land only uh, for one season Uh, there are there are other land owners who mostly in places where it has not been farmed before um a, a, a farmer might come and maybe dig a well and uh, they they invest a lot of uh, money in digging this well uh, in this kind of instance the land owner might uh, might might give a longer lease to the farmer so that they can recoup the money that they used to to dig the well and this might go maybe for one or two years but in other instances you might find that farmers are there for only one season or two seasons so really it it is it, de it depends on um, on the agreement and also on the capital that um, that the farmers have uh, that the tajiri sorry that the tajiris have to invest in the farming mm -hmm. um uh, what do you see as major opportunities or strategies to scale this up um the the major opportunity that um that is there um is basically to because the 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 major opportunity that is there is to basically um look into irrigation practices that will maximize the amount of of water that be, that is being used um there is also the, the sand river itself um the way it is the the the, the nature of the sand river is that it refills or it, it uh, refills after every rainy season uh, the sun any 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 flood that comes through the area it will refill the it will refill the sand um, the sand river aquifers and this uh, really brings out the the opportunity in terms of nature based uh, water storage for for irrigation development and this can be scaled up also to other areas uh, in terms of um, where even the, the 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 there are sand rivers but there is not enough quantity of sand to hold enough enough water for irrigation there are areas where um you can use uh, natural barriers are called sand dams uh, which which are constructed across the river channel 
and this uh, this hold back the sand from washing down and increases the capacity of storage of the sand river. Also, um, in terms of uh, sand harvesting, as I said, sand harvesting is uh, is, uh, is something that is is uh, being practiced in some parts of the of the of the river, and it's something that cannot be wished away because it is benefiting directly the local youth uh, in the area. So there is. Um, an opportunity to maybe prevent the conflict resolution is that you can find areas where uh, sand can be have, sand maybe sand dams can be um, can be constructed to be able to hold sand for for harvesting purposes so as not to destroy the whole stretch of the river but to have specific points where you can have uh, sand harvesting and uh, harvesting sand so that it can be it can be used for construction while other areas are left for irrigation. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, thank you, Benson. I have a question. We have already reached the end of uh, the like we have uh, reached the end of the allocated time for uh, uh, for the webinar. But if you're up for it, we still have three yes. or four more questions. Would you uh, yes, would it be okay with okay. you if you uh, if we take a few more questions? Okay. Thanks a lot. Thanks for your uh, patience and time. <laughs> Uh, again, uh, from uh, Robert, more of a comment this time around is uh, he's sharing his experience. We have seen major opportunities for well construction on the actual banks of the river instead of the river itself. The aquifers are often connected and this reduced pumping head, but also reduced dangers of flooding and losing equipment. Uh, have you seen such abstraction on the um, bank? No, no, uh, I, I have. Um, Pajiado. I have not. Uh, maybe you're you're talking about uh, well construction in terms of drilled wells. I I hope that's uh, that's what you refer to as well construction. Um, I have not seen um, well like drilling of of uh, shallow wells uh, near the on the banks. What 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 is mostly common there that is um, are are wells like big wells maybe of um, around 15 meters in diameter or 10 meters in diameter. Um, which are there, and as you say, they are um, they are less prone to they are less prone to flooding, but they also cost more to they also cost more to dig. Therefore, um, because of this cost, farmers some farmers you find them uh, avoiding them and, and wanting to go to the to the easier route of digging scoop holes uh, at the at the riverbeds. And also, um, well construction is uh, it's it's something that. Can have an opportunity for the for the landowners, I would say, because um, they will they will ensure that they will have uh, accessible water to to the farmers who come to lease land on their on their parcels of land, because uh, the the land parcels of land which has which has maybe has a well or has already dug well will cost more to to lease and therefore it will have uh, more income for the landowner. Thank you. You uh, spoke about the intensive use of, uh, you know, pesticides and stuff and such and fertilizers. Uh, and there's a question regarding that. Uh, are there any potential risks uh, of water pollution from the use of pesticides, as mentioned, and fertilizers, perhaps, uh, if uh, that is also something that happens? Yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Yes, the, the risk is, is uh, there, though it was not. Um, it, it has not been studied in 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 my in my work that I did there. But it's it's something that is actually there because, um, as I said, the, the 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 irrigation or the farming is done very close to the river, not more than 500 meters uh, away from the river. And in any case, when when there is a, when there is a, a lot of pesticides used and a lot of fertilizers used. And this is being used for a season before people, before the farmers you move to another to another area. You might find that uh, with any rainy season, these these um, these pesticides are washed down into the into the sand river and into the aquifers. And with more and more farmers coming into the area, or if there is more, there is increased intensity in the use of these pesticides. Um, a study done on the on the quality of water in the aquifers might really be different uh, right now from maybe let's say five years down the line so there is really a, a big risk of, of water pollution if this is not controlled thank you 
there's a clarification from Robert who points out that what he is referring to uh, is not really giant wells which are also used for livestock. He's referring to low-cost drilling, the kind of wells that uh, are uh, dug using low-cost drilling. No, Robert, there, um, were, there, so, were, no, yeah, there were no low-cost uh, there were no low cost drill, drilling uh, well, drilled wells in the area, just, just, the, big, um, just the, big, the big wells. It's, it's, a, it's an opportunity, actually, because um, it, it, it presents, it's, it's an opportunity for the, for the, for the farmers themselves, what I'm not quite sure is is the yield amount of the of the wells and if they may support. What what I kind of think is that farmers prefer these uh, big wells because they have this illusion that it has a lot of water and therefore it it might uh, it might be able to support bigger uh, bigger parcels of land. Um, low cost drilling is very is very possible though. I would think that there need to, needs to be done, uh, let's say, um, pump testing to know the actual yields uh, of of the of the wells, so as to be so so that the farmers can know if it might support um, what size of land. Thank you. We will close with uh, two uh, questions quite related to each other. Um, Goni Mufute. I um, hope I have pronounced your name correctly, uh, asks if this type of irrigation is recognized by the government and if there's any form of, of, uh, of, of assistance that is offered to the irrigators. Uh, Lakshman asks what could be one of what could be one of the ways of working with the government for mainstreaming this um, learning within the government system. With the, Ngoni, the, the, I, I would say the, the irrigation is recognized. It's, it's not really... Uh, because there are government agencies and, and the agricultural officers of the government who are in the area and they recognize this kind of uh, this kind of irrigation but the problem is that there, there is very little assistance offered to the irrigators uh, one one of the reasons i found was that because um, of the laws that are there currently like uh, if i may take an example of uh, farmers wanting subsidies fertilizer subsidies from the government they have to present uh, formal documents showing land ownership that they own land in a certain place and therefore they can be registered into this uh, uh, government system of maybe getting sub uh, fertilizer subsidies so you find with this area um, that such kind of regulation or such kind of rules they lock down they lock out many farmers who are dependent on these informal list type of uh, list type of agreements to to access land because if um, they're supposed to show formal documents that they own land, but they are not really the land owners, but they've leased land in uh, in informal ways, they are, they are locked down, they are locked out of being able to access them. So there's, in terms of policies, there's, there's recognition is there, the government knows the irrigation is there, but uh, when you go to now policy documents, the regulations or the rules which are there are what locks out many, many of the farmers. Um, one of the ways that um, the government could could um, that the, one of the ways of working with the government um, in mainstreaming this is, uh, I would say, um, carrying out more of um, a stakeholder um, stakeholder um, workshops with the farmers, bringing farmers together, uh, even if they are there for only short periods of time, and uh, kind of uh, getting to know uh, their experiences and getting to learn from uh, from the farmers what how uh, they should be or how the what which working systems work work best for them instead of the rules coming from the government side to the farmers the government should uh, more of uh, bring farmers on board so that they can be able to discuss uh, what really works for them and what doesn't work for them because it's it's something that is very uh, it's something that changes from one uh, one period to another something that also the players who are, who, are, who are participating in this kind of farming, they are also changing. So it is something that needs to be done constantly over, over a long period of time. Thank you, Benson. Thanks a lot. With that, we have truly reached the end of uh, the webinar. I have to assure you, Benson, thanks so much for your, uh, for your patience, right, okay. despite the fact that the discussions went slightly over time. Uh, for me, there were a lot of takeaways and uh, one of them was like a set of issues like, a, like the discussion that happened right towards the end. Uh, 
uh, which is that you know while it's great that small farmers are um, doing this at their own initiative uh, of course with the help of kind of outs outside entities like tajiris uh, it's really important that um, what we can call the formal sector so financial institutions government organizations extension organizations uh, that they all link up with these farmers a bit more and uh, provide them uh, some support that they need uh, but might often find lacking and the other thought uh, is about how this uh, phenomenon projects into the future the question of sustainability the red flag that benson placed on uh, uh, too much sand harvesting and the um, and uh, the possible shortages and disputes in the future it lends itself to the need to start thinking about how all this can be regulated a bit and regulated not in a stifling constraining way but uh, in an enabling way that keeps it sustainable uh thanks benson for uh, your great presentation and uh, thanks to you all the audience for uh, turning up in good numbers and for your great questions lots of questions and lots of comments thanks a lot uh, i have an announcement to make about a series of upcoming webinars sometime after october 15th uh, we will uh, confirm it to you soon uh, uh, we have a series of two webinars on a very interesting topic the application of artificial intelligence in water resource management the webinars will be conducted by dr uh, herardo uh, corzo perez i hope i have got the pronunciation of his name right who is an associate professor in hydroinformatics at iit and three iit alumni who have been working in this field in the field of artificial intelligence in africa latin america and asia respectively so look forward to that do join us there uh, uh, at those webinars i hope uh, you find the topic enticing enough and you will join us uh recording of this webinar uh, and uh, it updates regarding the upcoming webinars will be available on the water channel website let me just copy paste the link over here um so this is the water channel link and on the iit website and newsletters that you are well familiar with but let me place the link over here uh, just in case again uh so yeah here you can find information about the upcoming webinars and uh, follow up related to this webinar for now i would just like to say Thank thanks again especially to benson as the speaker and goodbye